Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 210 for Monday, May 6th, 2019. folks and welcome to gig gab you know the podcast by for and about working musicians here in durham new hampshire i'm dave hamilton here in los gatos california it's paul kent how are you mr kent you doing all right Quite, you were, i'm doing much better yeah that's good. good flu's gone body's getting back i actually had three gigs this past weekend um it was cool it's good you know and it's also getting to be summer and the gigs are starting to line up and yep getting in more of a rhythm i got an interesting request we simon and i simon's a guitar player in the house records we play um every other monday night at a it's it's a it's a it's called a marketplace it's called san pedro square marketplace and it's kind of like they have one big communal bar they have a great outdoor seating area and then they have a bunch of like different ethnic types of, of uh, food stands you know and there's a lot of places to socialize and sit anyway we've had this gig and uh, because the Warriors and the Sharks are both in the playoffs, they like people to come in and watch this stuff there. So they asked us if we would play for an hour or, or it's usually six to nine gig and the games are at seven. So they asked us to play six to seven and then just play at the intermission. At the tonight. one at the intermission. Regular. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, yeah. So sure, why not? It's going to be an yeah. easy one. We'll watch the games. We'll relax, play a little music. It'll be fun. That's perfect. That's the right way to do it. I've, I've been, as I'm sure you have, you know, booked for gigs when there's some big playoff game or, you know, whatever that couldn't have been predicted at the time the gig was booked, you know, and you wind up there and they're like, oh, yeah, no, just play. It's like, no, like the people don't want that. And sometimes you can sort of get them to to embrace the why don't we just play at the breaks? You know, that would be a good thing. And uh, and other times, you know, it's like it's just a fight all night. So that's good that yep. they they have they have embraced this. That's great. That's good. Yep. Yeah. Embracing the breaks. I'm always I, I, I find the breaks are our our tightest moments of the set. We start it together. We end together. You know, everything. <laughs> you got to rehearse them. Yeah, you do. But but as a as a you know, as a professional musician, I, I feel like we've we've put in our time rehearsing the breaks. We've woodshedded the break. So there you go. Perfect. Wood shedding the brakes. That's the uh, that's the title of this episode. You know, while I'm on the subject of the title of this episode. There are other things we do in addition to just naming the episode and recording the episode. We track everything we talk about in the show. We have links if there's like products or whatever that we talked about. And we put timestamps in too. If your podcast player supports it, you can actually see those timestamps and navigate around the show. Uh, but uh, but you can do that at our website at giggabpodcast.com. You can see them right there. And if you click on them, it'll bring the player right to that point. So if you want to hear a certain segment again, or if we're talking about something that you don't care about, you can skip to the next segment. You know, I mean, it, it's uh, so check that out. It's a it's a handy little thing. So and I know some of you use it, but yeah, yeah, we'll tell more of you about it. about it. It's really convenient. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. I had, Speaking of which, I, 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 let me just, just yeah, get this ahead. in real quick. My gig on Sunday. So Friday night, I had a coffee house gig. Saturday night, the house rockers played in a club. And then Sunday, tw one to four, I played at a winery. And uh, it was a pretty nice day. Got a little chill, cool out there unexpectedly. But the best part of my whole freaking weekend, and it was a great weekend, was a really nice guy came up during the winery gig and uh, not only gave me a tip, which was pretty cool, but he said, hey, I love Gig Gab. So that, that just always blows me away. I will never get over that, that this little thing that you and I have done that used to be just, let's, hey, let's record our phone conversations. When someone else lets us know, when they send us a note, you know, we get an email, we get a post on the, on the Facebook page or anything, or even better, when someone comes up, I think it is the greatest thing. So I didn't catch the guy's name, but if he's a listener of Gig Gab, he's hearing this. And I just want to thank him so much for just taking a moment to say that he listens because it is, it is really Really, it, it just excites me so much that this thing that we like to do so much, uh, other people get a kick out of. It's true. Uh, it I it, like I mean, I've been podcasting 14 years. We've been doing this show four years. Right. 
it, which yeah. is a long time in the in the podcast world. And I still like am just as giddy when someone recognizes me for doing this thing as as I am, as I was at the you know the first time it happened. It, it, it does not lose its luster. So please Never. don't feel like it has, uh, you know, feel free to say something. Uh, it, it's not awkward and it's fantastic. So, yep. Yep. Agreed. We would love iTunes reviews, too. While we're at it, I will make sure that giggabpodcast.com slash iTunes gets you to the, the closest place that I can get you at iTunes for you to then like take the next couple of steps and, and leave us a review. Uh, it it mean, not only does it mean a lot, as we just said, but it also helps a lot because those iTunes reviews add up and, and it does help us rank and then more people get to listen and we get more feedback and it helps everybody. So yes, it's good. It's good. Cool. I am. Um, so I will giggabpodcast.com slash iTunes and I'll make sure that works before the show is published. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. I had, so I had a, a busy week. I saw a band. I saw a band called part of me, Doug down at the stone church. They're a, a fish tribute band. And we just ran down there on Friday night and saw them a little bit. And then um, Wednesday, I actually did a recording session and Saturday I had an uptown gig and, and there are many lessons that I, I learned this week. The first one, and I, I know this lesson, but um, I, it, it, the lesson is fake it till you make it right. And specifically with regards to singing, if you are tentative with your singing, it will never sound good. And sometimes, you know, I, I've caught myself recently. I, for whatever reason, I always am uh, uh, more anxious about singing when I'm, when I'm doing so in Madhouse because, I, you know, I'm performing with, with some like world-class singers uh, that are, you know, these theater folks. And so it's like, oh crap, like in a rock and roll <laughs> scenario, man, I will belt all day long. I don't like, I don't care I, I I do care, but I I'm confident, right? I I believe that I am confident. Uh, it, sometimes with Madhouse, I catch myself, and it's like, no, like you have to be confident, and uh, and it will sound better. Trust me. It you you may not sound as good as that person over there, but if you know that you can sing, just sing. Don't back off. Don't you know? Just dig in and go. That will be the best that it is. You don't want to overdo it, but just without a doubt, confident. You know, I, I could talk about this forever because um, I think I've shared with you. I'm, I'm not a singer, and the only reason I sing or became a singer is when I decided to put a band together. I couldn't find, I couldn't find someone to front a band in a way that I felt comfortable playing behind, and you know, I just didn't, you know, sure. connect. I mean, there was one guy, but then he moved right after he, he uh, auditioned for us. But he was he was really good. But you know, there was a lot of stuff that was just too too silly or too theatrical and it wasn't the vibe. And so I just was filling in until we could find someone and I'm still looking, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. 20 years later, hey, but, that's, um, that's what happened to Phil Collins in Genesis, right? When, all right. Uh, when, yeah, when Gabriel left, they brought in people, they auditioned people and you know, their songs were like weird and not necessarily everybody that came in knew their tunes. So Phil would sing the tunes for these people and then they would, you know, and then they would, would play. And it took them a few months or whatever. And finally, they're like, you know, nobody's doing it as well as Phil is. Why? Um, how do you feel about that, Phil? And so that's there you go. Yeah, that's how it worked out. And he's widely regarded as one of the great pop voices that is. It right? is so true. Yeah, they, and, they, dodged, and they dodged a bullet by by potentially missing that opportunity. That's right. Absolutely. Yep. And yep. That, that's kind of my point to this is like my journey as a singer. I'm sure there are a lot of people who can relate to it. And I have. I, you know, I'm, I'm still seeking. I'm still trying to learn. I've spent a lot of time getting formal training and the, the things that are interesting about, especially singing rock and roll confidence is a, a huge part of it. The thing about pitch, you know, pitch is non-negotiable. You have to, you have to sing on pitch. Of course. But the thing about pitch is, is that in general, once you feel a little bit of comfort that you have learned about how your instrument works, pitch will often take, well, just about all the time, takes care of itself. Pitch doesn't take care of itself when you try too hard. Pitch doesn't take care of itself um, when you're constantly fiddling with your instrument searching. When you yes. allow yourself to sound like you um, and not try to sound like somebody else, um, when you learn how to breathe, which is the, the essence of all singing, pitch will pitch will take care of itself and then confidence will get you along. You may not have the greatest tone and tone is, you know, a Holy grail that you're, that you're out looking for. Yep. But I am, you know, 
I'm a kid of rock and roll. I love rock and roll. And, you know, the songs that move me that I bring into the band that I really love to do, the, the, the process of emoting those and connecting with them, performing them and feeling that thing that I feel when I used to listen to them as a kid or, you know, in yeah. my life, that is a, that is a sacred thing, man. That will, that will get you a long way. Again, pitch is non-negotiable, but pitch can take care of itself if you learn mechanics. Yes. Right? And you just and then, have to trust yourself. Uh, you do. Y you know, I, um, we, it, so at Madhouse, the end of the show, we always, um, invite the crowd down onto the stage and it just turns into a dance party. And mm -hmm. usually we will play the first song of that dance party and then we'll kind of let the house take over so we can start breaking down our stuff and, you know, get mm -hmm. out of there because it's Wednesday. And uh, the last tune of this most recent Madhouse was a tune called Wild Wild West by some rapper or something. And as I dug in and started oh, learning. That's Will Smith, isn't it? Maybe. Is it? Maybe it is. Yeah. Oh, it could be. Sure. That makes sense. Um, yeah, I think that's from the um, from the movie Wild Wild West. Maybe that's it. So, yeah. but what that song actually is, is Stevie Wonder's I Wish. Right. right. Exactly. Okay. So that's exactly it. So as we're doing that, I'm like, oh, well, why don't we just do I Wish? Like, we'll just stay in the groove and just circle back to the top, to the head. And, uh, y you know, we'll sing a verse and a chorus and maybe another verse and a chorus if we want to keep going. And we'll just, you know, we'll just stay there. And so, of course, you know, I took the, vol I volunteered to sing the tune. Now, I got lucky because <laughs> Stevie does that in E flat minor. Mm-hmm. It turns out the house rockers do that in D minor. Yes. And I had a chart, a vocal chart from when I subbed for you that had it in D minor. And there is a big difference for Dave in singing <laughs> that song one half step down. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because we rehearsed it in 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 uh, E flat minor. And then it was like somebody was like, but do you have a chart? And I'm like, uh, actually, yeah, but it's in D minor. And they're like, that's fine. We'll just do it there. It's way easier on guitar, too. And uh, or at least that's what they said. And, <laughs> and, and then I listen, and, but it's still like, while we were doing it, I'm like, you know, it's the end of the night. It doesn't matter. I'll just sing it. Like, who cares? No, one, no one's going to listen anyway. They're just dancing and it's, you know, a typical, like, you know, rock and roll gig. And then I heard the tapes of it. I was like, wait a minute. Hey, I actually hey. sounded pretty good. <laughs> there you oh, go. wait a minute. If I'm not worried about it and I just sing, like I know how to sing and I do what I'm supposed to do. Hey, it works really well. <laughs> You know, and it, that's so that's where this topic came from. So if you think so about thank this, thank you for doing it in D minor in the House Rockers. I don't know you're welcome. whose decision that was. Maybe Nick made the uh, the same half step decision that I would have made or maybe it was for the horns. I don't know. But thank you. So our pleasure. Dave. Yeah. Um, so I would say you're absolutely right. Uh, trust yourself is great. Emote and sing with confidence. Confidence will take you a long way. Three, and then trust yourself has to do with your body will get you to pitch yeah. and keep you on pitch if you trust yourself. Just don't overdo it. it. Don't over don't, Well, that's the thing. Yeah. Over singing. The, the, the desire to add little flourishes. Little glisses, glisses and flourishes. If you're not trained and practice on those things, that's what will make you sound amateurish. Yes. Right? Over singing. You will get very far. Just sing, sing one note you know, per lyric, per word, and just keep it simple. That will solve so many ills. The thing that if you go now, now with this in your mind, go out and listen to people who sing karaoke, go out and listen to, you know, amateur, not great cover band singers. There's there. The thing that will stick out to you is the, not pitch usually, because again, someone who has, has enough confidence that they can keep pitch will find their way to a stage, right? If you can't on a pitch, you're probably not going to get to a stage. It's not going to happen. But, right. But what makes someone sound amateurish is the is the, the extra glisses up to a note, you know, the 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 uh, lack of breath at the end of a phrase, you know, the, the, trying to do these riffs and these types of things when you really can't do it. You're not Mariah Carey. Dave, you are not Mariah Carey. It's just not going to happen. Right. So keep it simple and uh, and you can get a long way, especially with guy rock and roll. Yeah. I mean, again, you know, it's yeah. it's a little different with. With, uh, you know, the great rock singers, but for much of the stuff you do, if you just keep it simple, you're you fine. Will, you, will, you are fine. I, I like your advice of one note per word that that is like if you need if you take one thing away from this episode, that's it. One note per word. That's all you need. That's it. That's it. Boom. We um, 
we had a you know we had this uptown gig in uh, on Saturday and it was a it was a, a benefit gig but it it had the pacing of a wedding you, you know it was that classic get there at four o'clock in the afternoon so you're set up before any of the guests arrive ha- cocktail music happens while they're doing their cocktail hour and then they have dinner and then we play it's fine we know this drill we've played at this club at this function center before, many times before I've actually played there with Fling a few times it, it all fine. Um, and the gig actually went really well. We did this last year and they went, ran really late with their fundraising drive or whatever. We only played like 45 minutes and it was basically well, people were putting their coats on and leaving. Um, this time they they sort of wrangled their schedule under control a little better. We, we were supposed to play two hours. We might have played an hour and 20 minutes. So like that's pretty good. Uh, that's That's more than we anticipated. And the people were into it, which was great. There were, however, we played a bunch of new songs at the last gig. And they went really well. And that's dangerous because it means no one looked at them between the last gig Mm. and Saturday. So we had a few moments. Uh, There was one moment in particular where uh, we started a tune. We started Jet Airliner. So, uh, Marty, I'm I'm going to I'm going to hang out to dry a little bit here, buddy. But trust me, you're all it's all good. We love you. Um, uh, And uh, and Marty skipped to, to starting the third verse. (laughs) <laughs> and now it was somewhat serendipitous because, you know, Jet Airliner has that big, long intro that's an entire verse and chorus instrumental. He skipped that, too, and just started singing the verse like right after the, you know, four times through the, you know, whatever that thing is, that mm-hmm. kind of sort of crossroads intro that, that Steve Miller did. Uh, and that's a good idea. And we're going to keep that because it's you don't need to stretch that thing out, like get to the vocals, like don't bore us, get to the chorus. Right. Uh, but he he skipped to the, the third verse. Or started singing the third verse, and and right. that was he touching. He was touching down in New England town before it was time. He was. You got it. That's exactly right. <laughs> yes. And so we all knew what happened. But the question then amongst us that, of course, was un, uh, uh, non vocalized was, are we still at the first verse and he's just singing the third verse, or have we thrown away the first page of this song and we're starting? What's your, the top what of is page your two? personal assumption? When that happens. Oh, I don't assume anything. I listen because oh. it, you know, it's, it's and and the, and the reason I bring this up is the concept of right is non-binary when you are on stage <laughs> performing a song. It is like, there is no question in this scenario that there were, you know, five of us that were right and one that was wrong. However, in the end, it turned out that the one person chose the right path Right. Because he's the one singing the song. So it doesn't matter. He's right. Follow him. And so we did. We didn't play the first half of the song. We he realized what happened. He stayed where he was. And we just sang the, you know, whatever, the third verse, the chorus, the fourth verse, and then chorus, you know, ad infinitum on the way out. And we ended the tune. And and it was fine because when he went and sang the fourth verse as the, you know, next. So the second sung verse was the fourth verse. It was like, okay we are at the end of the song. They're like, doesn't matter. The first two verses, not tonight, folks, you know, and Mm -hmm. and here we are. But it's that idea of we all know that you're not right, but we're going to make you right anyway, because that's the best thing for all of us in this scenario. And it's that whole, you know, there's no I in team kind of scenario, but I it, would only interject there that, uh, assumptions that the form is still going to be the storm or the form, regardless of what lyrics the guy is singing would probably carry the day in my band. Most of the time, like if the guy messes up the lyrics, don't assume that he's lost in the form, right? You know, he's, he's just going to either sing that same one again or, you know, whatever it's going to be the form and especially with us, because we have horn charts, maybe that that might be the difference. That's different. We're sure. kind of we're kind of bound to reading through stuff. And if someone really, you know, a, a person singing a song, I can't think of a time where a person has bailed on the concept of a form. I can That's think about brain farts on on lyrics. Sure. But, you know, something else has to happen. Something else has to happen. Then there's the horn break. Then something else has to happen. If something really gets so far down a a train wreck that the form has been abandoned by the guy singing the song. Yeah. That's a pretty rare thing. Yeah, it is a rare thing. It, it you know, it, it, but it happened, you know, and I think, <laughs> I, I'm in my, but my, and I think but it Marty, didn't happen. What's that? It didn't happen. The lyrics got, he, he was, he was ready to complete the form. He just put lyrics in the wrong place. 
Uh, well, maybe, uh, but he didn't like, we didn't do the first, we didn't do four verses. We did two. Oh, okay. Got it. That's well, how what did I'm you saying. figure out which, how did you figure out which one was going to get left off? Well, he, he started, at, way- he started at verse three. Oh, and, you did. And we played There's verse three, three through to the end. Oh, is There's that right? Three. Are there yeah. all, is that right? I thought there were yeah. four. Well, whatever. He, he started with the second verse then. Sorry. Got it. And, and, and then down we went through the, uh, through the rest of the tune. Yeah. So we skipped, we skipped the first, I guess just, yeah, the first verse, which is a, lo- a long verse, maybe, maybe, no, I guess it's not. We, we skipped the, the first verse and, and chorus and, and the, the little break there. And just, what was the communication to let you know? I mean, he, if he sang, so he sang verse, verse two and three. Correct. And so all the, all, everybody figured out, we just lost a verse. We just lopped one off at the top. Yep. It wasn't like any communication. And I guess the fact that he went, he went to he verse went to three. the third verse. Correct. Yeah, if he would have gone to verse one, then then chaos would have would have assumed. Yes, then it's probably that's probably right. Yeah, no, he made the right choice to just like, yep, I'm gonna I'm just gonna push us through, and we're we're starting here, and now we all know where we are. But but uh, it is, and I remember we had some moments like that in the MacWorld All Star Band, and and in that band there were people of varying um, experience, experience levels. Yeah. yeah. And and there would be I, there were a few moments I remember where somebody was like, no, I, I know I'm right. I'm, I'm playing the song that I remember I heard on the record. It's like, yeah, but and you are right. And the defense stipulates. But the rest <laughs> of the band is over here and you have to join us. Like there's it's like you, you got to come with us on this one. Like the, and it, most of the time in those scenarios, the singer is right. Uh, you know, like that it, when all else fails, it, it I, the way I look at it is the first person who is right is the singer and the second person who is right is the drummer, because if the drummer ends the song, the song is over. Right. Yeah. I mean, right. Like, you know, otherwise it's a it, now you've gone train wreck. Right. But it's singer first. That's as the drummer. That's where I always go. And if if the singer isn't right and it's still fluid, now I'll take charge and I'll do a big fill into a chorus or something, you know, you know, to to make it clear that that's where we're going. Yep. But you got it. You got to have the the sensibility and confidence to, to do that. But that the good sense. news was this was like the second or third song we played. And after that, everybody was on high alert the rest of the night, Mm -hmm. which is a good thing. Like getting on stage. I mean, you don't want to be in panic mode, but you do want to be. You're reminded that you have to listen. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's right. Hey, we started on an interesting song. I don't know if you know this song. Uh, I just want to celebrate by Rare Earth. Oh, nice tune. Yeah. It is a nice tune, but it's an interesting tune. So the groove is interesting yep. different it is different. it's an extremely sparse and simple song and it's got a bit of a weird um got a bit of weird a bit of a weird <coughs> roadmap <coughs> and um um it's so sparse it's like we brought it in russ had said yeah I've, I've been in bands i've tried to do this before they just can't get through it i don't know have you ever tried it before have you ever played it before no i've never played it before yeah, it's just such a very simple, you're singing over a basic riff. There's not a lot of chords. There's a little bit of, you know, there's one section where you get a couple chords. Sure. It's just so sparse and it's all carried by this kind of gang vocal. I was going to say, if you don't, high as well. if, if everybody doesn't like know the song, you could be in real trouble with a tune like that. I think. Yeah. 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 Well, we're going into second week of trying to work on it. Yeah. The first week everybody came in, realized that. It was so simple. It was hard. And yes. Then, you know, when we had a couple <laughs> so of weeks off and everybody said, I was like, guys, we only have a couple more rehearsals scheduled for this year before we're done for the summer. You know, you got to come in, bring it completely ready, which yeah. is a side conversation, right? Like I've seen a lot of posts about this stuff lately. Like rehearsals are not for learning songs. Therefore, you know, working out transitions and checking that everybody learned the same thing the right way. Right. I don't know. I, I think it depends on what, how your band does it. it I mean, it, I think different bands are different ways. I, right. I, fundamentally I agree with, with that statement that like rehearsals are not for learning, therefore polishing and and rehearsing the thing you already know. However, I I say that and I live a different life in fling because we will play a tune. Usually we'll listen, you know, somebody will have an idea for a song Oftentimes that idea comes in at about 3 p.m. on the day of a rehearsal. So there's no way that this is going to actually be prepped. But I also know that whoever that person is that, that decided to bring it in 
is going to insist on trying it that night. Right. Mm -hmm. So we'll listen to it together at least, you know, enough of it to get a tempo and, and a groove. If we, if we know the song well enough, it's like, okay, great. Yep. Fine. And, and then we'll play it through once. And it's usually, you know, not great it, it, and, and it varying degrees of not great. Sometimes it, it'll just fall together. It's like, oh, sweet. That's great. But, uh, you know, other times it's just rough. And, but isn't uh, it true that what happens is everybody in their band, especially if your band's been together for a while, mm-hmm. you intrinsically know what level of preparedness the other guys in the band will bring. Yep. And that's one part of it. But there's the other part of it is how your band is going to attack the song and the subtle things that you're going to work through anyway. Right. Right. You know, it, you know, we, we have to rearrange the harmonies anyway. We have to, you know, on the record, there's six guitars. So which two are we going to choose for this, yep. for this section? Right. So there's, there's always a certain amount of tinkering with the songs anyway. So you come in knowing the form, you come in basically knowing your part. Right. And then you start to assemble it. You play it through one time and, uh, and you see what part of it is working, what's not working with, with the instrumentation and things you have like there, you know, there's parts of songs and this one's actually a pretty good one. Um, it's a little hard to sing over that syncopated riff, right? Yeah. Right. So that, you know, that's, that riff has to do what it does, but does everybody have to play that complete riff or can the guy singing lead? Yeah. You know, sort basically of half simplify it a little it. bit. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and those are the types of decisions that you make. So again, when I see those, those memey things, those memes that uh, say, you know, rehearsal is not for learning songs. I, it's up to your band what you do. I mean, there's it a lot of bands is. that don't ever, you know, you come together and, you know, you piece a song together and that's part of the joy of it as well. So and that's part of I, it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. No, I agree. Uh, it, 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 because that's just how it goes. You've, you know, you, you unless think- you have a band that is like committed to, you know, we only have X amount of time. This is the only way we're going to get any stuff done. So here's the expectation is set up a front. You have bought into this or you don't bought into it, buy into it. And you know, that's how your band operates. And that's how your band operates. Yeah. It, but, it, but what I have found and I, I recently, so yeah, so you have those stumble throughs, right. And then, and then you sort of figure it out I, I, just as a musician, I find that I like, if you tell me and I can do it, it's fine. You know, like we're playing a gig on Saturday, learn this tune. We're, we're not going to sound check it. We're just going to play it, you know, in the first set. I can do that. But until I have played a song through with a band, like yeah. not along with a recording, but with a band where I have to drive the bus, you know, it is like I need to have that experience of what it means to drive the bus on this particular song. And that's where that stumble through helps me immensely because it's like, oh, got it. OK, so there's this this turnaround that somebody needs to set up. Otherwise, we fall apart, you know, and if it's not the bass player, then it's the guitar player. It's me or whatever. But like learning how a song can be played as opposed to knowing the song. And I a great example of this is Fling decided just for the studio, not for playing live. But but there's enough Rush fans in in Fling that we decided we should learn a Rush song. I started throwing around songs like Spirit of Radio or Free Will, songs that are essentially pop songs that that Rush has played. I mean, it, you know, pop song with an asterisk because they always yeah. take little detours. But the song where the form is very uh, predictable, by and large, we settled on Red Barchetta. Now, I know Rush tribute bands that will play like natural science and won't play Red Barchetta because the form of it is so atypical. It is essentially a 20 minute prog rock opus compressed into four minutes and whatever, 58 seconds or whatever it turns out to be. Like there's all these different sections. Sometimes you you play a section that you played before, but this time you're playing it in seven, eight instead of eight, eight. It, you know, mm. it's just like weird things. It's a very difficult song. But it's a song I know in my bones, right? I mean, I've I've been a Rush fan since, you know, I was like 14 or something. And this song was one of the very first Rush songs I ever heard. And I've played it along with the record on my drums. That is very different than driving a band through this tune. And the first time we played it, I was lost. I had no idea where we went. So I had to go back through the chart and write in little notes like, oh, play this drum part here, play this fill. Like, I know all these things, 
but I didn't, I don't know them in order. You know, I know them. Yeah, based sometimes on, you don't know things the way you think, you know, the things. way you I find think, that you know, a lot them. Of stuff. yeah. Like and I, another thing is I when you play on it guitar, in a different context, yes. yeah, that's what I was just going to say that there may be just a subtle one note, two note, you know, emphasis, not even a riff, just, you know, something that pops out yeah. that your brain is connected to, you know, what you're supposed to do next. And that's what I'm saying. When your band, your guy didn't emphasize it quite as much, but it's what triggered you to get to the next section of the song. That's why you, that's why you got to run through stuff. That's why you got to, yeah. And it's been very, I would bet this also, any band that's worth its salt knows what type of song you can tell your band learn this and we'll run it and sound yes. check and then we'll give it a go. Yeah. Like, you know, there, right. there is a lot of music that you can do that with. Totally. Rush is never going to live in that, in that, you know, category, but you know, you know but everyone I, like, knows what, like spirit, spirit of radio is a song that I have played live and never rehearsed. We've played it live and chafed. Now chafed hasn't played in a number of years, but Maddie, the guitar player, Steve, the bass player, and I all grew up as like crazy rush fans. We never played in, in a band together where we played a rush tune, but there was one night where there was one very, you know, determined group of people that wanted us to play Rush. And, you know, we would start like Tom Sawyer. We, we started a couple of different tunes and then just quickly abandon them just to sort of placate like, oh, there it was. OK, you got your Rush thing. Now we're going to go back to playing Jesse's Girl. It's all good, you know. And, uh, and Why not Limelight? That seems like the most obvious one. It's really hard. Really, really hard. Yeah, it's because it's got those <laughs> weird turnarounds and stuff. It's a very difficult song to play. Um, <laughs> uh, yep. But that's the thing is like they they you don't know until you like di- start to dissect them. And and so at one of those moments, uh, you know, the guy, the guys just kept at it. And so Maddie started Spirit of Radio and Steve and I looked at each other and counted in and hit uh, like every syncopated break, you know, through the intro. And then suddenly we're in the tune wow. and it's like. Okay, we've made it through the hard part. Like the rest of this song's really easy. And and between Steve and I, we were able to kind of sort of sing it and we made it all the way through to the end. And then the next gig, somebody requested Rush and it was like, sure. Got that. (laughs) Got that. Yeah. Um, But but most I agree with you most of the time. And when we did that Queen Madhouse, I sat the band down and I said, "Okay, here's the thing. We all know these songs from the radio. And that means that each of us are going to be relied upon by the rest to play those cue lines that tell us what we're supposed to play next. And if the cue line is missing, we're going to be a little lost. And if all the cue lines are missing, we're going to be really lost. So even if you get lost and flub something, do not abandon ship, come back, keep playing because chances are someone else needs to hear what you're about to play in order for them to play the thing they're about to play that cues you to play the thing you're supposed to play. Like it's this interlocked thing and we are a codependent relationship. We, we have not had enough rehearsal on this. Everybody just needs to do their part no matter what. And we got through it. You know, everybody, like we all had our moments, of course. Uh, but you know, there was enough, uh, uh, reminders you know hints throughout that just got us through to the end and it's it's but it's interesting speaking of reminders um the place where we do madhouse the seacoast rep theater is doing steel magnolias uh, uh i don't actually i don't know i don't think it's a musical uh, in fact i'm certain it's not um mm-hmm. it's uh it's a play but there is music being played i guess it happens inside a hair salon or something and they needed songs to be played on a radio in there that they turn on and off as part of music licensing. You cannot just take a pre-recorded song and play it in a theater show on like the recording of the original artist doing that song. You can't play that without getting the rights specifically for that purpose. It's not like playing it in a club where you can just pay your you know BMI or ASCAP rights or whatever. But what you can do is play someone else's recording of that song if you have the rights from the person that recorded it. So we were asked to go and record, you know, 15 songs so that they could be played in the show. And uh, the directors, producers of Madhouse said, yeah, just get together in one night and play 15 songs. And it's like record 15 songs in, in like four hours. Like what? That's crazy. Now, we were able to sort of, you know, uh, back off the difficulty level by not really having to worry about beginnings and ends of songs. 
because, you know, these things were supposed to happen on the radio. And so, the you know, a song could easily start in the middle when they just flip on the radio. In fact, it's probably better if it does more realistic. And uh, Andrew, our sound engineer, who also engineered the recording, we did it here at, at my studio, said, well, wait, wait, we can make this really easy. Why don't we just take the original studio recording and use that as the guide track and just play along with it and then just obviously not mix it in to the final recording. That way we have a form guide. We have a vocal guide. Everything's good. And I had forgotten all about this, this trick, but years ago when we did our demo for uh, groove syndicate or ghetto fabulous, whatever the band was called at the time, uh, we did something very similar. We, we only did snippets of songs. We did like 90 seconds of, of, I don't know, six or seven tunes. And we did the same thing. I chopped them up and, and made these guide tracks so that we could just play along with them. It, if you're doing anything like that, especially for your cover band where you want to, you know, highlight what you're doing, very similar to what we did for Groove Syndicate or whatever, you want to build like a little demo or yourselves, th doing it along to those guide tracks is the best way to just mm. get it done quickly. You're not necessarily looking for perfection. Obviously, these aren't your tunes anyway. It doesn't really matter. You know, you're not selling these or anything. You're just putting it together f so that you have like some snippets of songs that people can hear. Then they're also going to see your videos and all that other stuff. But to round out the package and so you don't spend a fortune and, uh, or a lot of time either way uh, that I'd forgotten about that trick of using the, you know, the the original as the guide track. You have to be doing it in the same key. So right. that that, you know, or have some way via software to change the key of the guide track. But otherwise, yeah, it's super helpful. So so we did. We got through like, I don't know, 12 or 13 songs or whatever it was in, in like three hours. It's a lot of work. It, yeah. Yeah. It, we, you know, we just bl burned through them. It was like, was that good enough? Yeah, it's fine. Because it's background. <laughs> it's wallpaper, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it didn't need to be this perfection thing. But uh, so, yeah. It, have you guys... Have you guys, do you guys have any recordings as part of your only board recordings of, of uh, live shows? Got it. Yeah. And that's enough too. I think, I mean, if they're mixed relatively well, right. When I first started the band, you know, in the first six months, whoever the players were at that time, we did a, a formal demo, Yeah, which was cool. Um, it was interesting because it sounds even, I remember even when we got it, it's clean, but there's something, you know, about like a, a live pop or a live edge to the horns that, it, that, you know, it sounded a little too compressed and, you know, it didn't, yeah. didn't quite sound like the sound that it felt like when we play it live. And, and I've talked to a lot of people about it over time. So I should bring it in sometime and, and uh, we should listen to it on the show. And maybe you can tell me what you think should, should happen. Sure. Yeah. 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 It fun. is weird getting, uh, you know, getting the sound of, I'm getting instrument sounds in general, but you know, acoustic instruments are always the toughest, right? Because we're used to hearing them just in the air, uh, you know, a, gu a guitar goes through uh, a, a, an electric guitar, rather, goes through a lot of processing before it comes out of the speaker. Not to say that the speaker isn't also a huge part of the sound, but there's all these other things that you kind of put in 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 line there. Um, whereas, you well, know, but a, a horn, even on the acoustic instruments as well. That's right? what I'm you got a microphone, you've got, you know, some kind of a preamp, you've got, you know, the board itself colors the sound. I mean, it's but, just but really we're used to hearing a trumpet in the air. Right. Yeah. And so you've got to there's make a it, sound of a trumpet. There's a sound of a snare drum. Right. I mean, like there's these things. And if if you're not capturing that or if you're over affecting it, uh, even unintentionally, just because of the the, the process by which it was recorded, yeah. like, it, it can really change. Yeah, I'm totally with you. It can take the take the life out of it. Uh, in a, in a very, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Hey, I've crazy. got a show coming up on Saturday night. So I, I've been talking about this a few times that we've started doing these ticketed shows. Yeah. And we do them uh, at a really nice winery that has a really nice event center. And we did our first one last October, sold it out. 400 tickets was really pretty thrilling. And it was a good, uh, it was a good time had by all. We did another show that was a much higher ticket, price because it included a dinner for Valentine's Day. Um, that, there were a lot of learnings there. And now we have so our second just kind of dance event. Sure. And we have a good relationship with the um, with the winery. So we partner really well and you know good information flows back and forth. Ticket sales are good. Um, the curve is a little bit different than it was the first time we did it. But um, uh, you know, the first time we did it, I wanted to make sure it sold out. So I took right. like a full page ad in the local newspaper and, you know, did a bunch of stuff. Um, and I wasn't convinced that that full page ad affected 
our success that much. So this time I'm not doing the full page ad and the relative value of the cost of that ad versus how many tickets it sold us, you know, is, is what we'll look at afterwards. But it's, we've talked about like, you know, controlling your own ship. Again, if, if you have an audience, well, actually, if you have an audience or the reason I think these winery shows are so interesting is because the wineries have an audience. It's that interesting soft spot between people who love to go out dancing, but really don't want to go to a bar, really don't want to go to a nightclub. Right. Yep. Uh, this is a venue that allows that we play seven to 10. It's, you know, they come, they you know sit in a nice place, you know, it's wine and uh, it's wine. And um, I think that beer as well, wine and beer, no, no hard liquor. Um, but uh, people are willing to pay for a ticket to go to an environment that really works for them. And you, you said that's really what the stone church shows are for you. When we were doing those, yeah, it, yes, that, that's exactly right, is, is you're creating an environment that is slightly different than what they could get if they just, you know, showed up at, at some random pub or, or whatever. That's right. Yep. And I, I would say that the the interesting part of this lesson is, um, at least where I live, money for a ticket to go out for the night is not the problem. So, you know, that, that there are still places only charging $5 is kind of crazy. Most places have gone to a $10 cover charge for, yeah. for a nightclub, but really, um, you know, that's not even a full cocktail. Right. And I don't, I think that if you've done the work to put together a good show, um, cultivate an audience, I still think people want to reward your band, you know, whatever the right price for wherever you live is, is what you, it's up to you to figure out what it is. But I just still think that um, if you can figure these things out and find a place to do, you know, these types of shows, you, there's more elasticity to the price that you can put onto the ticket than you would think that there is. Absolutely. People want to yep. support the band. They, they just want a nice safe place to go. You know, for us, there's a zillion wineries around here. So it makes sense. They don't all have built in wine club member audiences. So that's, you know, that's part of it. So, you know, one thing that, that I've drawn is that here, um, wine wineries and their wine clubs, uh, people use those wineries almost like their personal country club, right? Yes. They spend a lot of time oh, there. Right. They go there on the weekends, they hang out, you know, that that's a large part of their social wineries, especially the medium to larger ones have a very vibrant social schedule, lots of tastings, dinners, you know, and, uh, you know, the wineries, if you think about where we are, the wineries are um, a little bit out of the way of the city. And so, you know, there's not a ton to do. I mean, there are downtowns to the little towns that are out there in the wine country, but, but, you know, as far as like big, exciting, fun, vibrant things to do, we've really hit onto something. I'm really happy with it. I mean, that I think we're going to do great on the yeah. again, Yeah. but um, the point of all this is that if you want to add to your band's mix of financial options learning how to do this is a pretty is a pretty smart thing yeah and, and it, again you know to your point the 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 price that you can charge i mean yeah, there is a level at which you are gouging people there's also a level at which people think you are gouging them and those two might be the same and and they might be a little bit different but but you'll find that out very quickly very quickly right? yeah and and as long as you sort of approach it the right way with your audience they will tell you, you know, either explicitly or implicitly where that number is. And and yeah, you can you can raise it up. It doesn't have to be like you said, five or ten bucks uh, is probably too low. You know, twenty five might be too high if you're not providing something in addition to just you. Right. But but maybe it's not. Depends on your well, area. It depends where you are. Yeah. Right? Like I said, so our our fee for this um, upcoming event is. Uh, at this nice winery is 22 for the wine club members, 25 okay. for non wine club members. Yeah. Um, and we're doing great on both of them. Um, and there's 30 at the door. So I really, you know, that's to try yeah. and get people to buy it in advance. Yeah. Of course. But, you know, last time we sold about 15% of the total tickets at the door. And the reason is here, I live in a pretty affluent area. Right. It's not the money. Right. It's it's the environment. That's yes. that's what it is here. Now, if you live, you know, in some area where, you know, it's harder to put together, a, you know, a, a vibrant, safe, you know, conducive um, venue, you know, then you got to figure out what the value of that is. And, you know, but all those things kind of go into the mix of, of what you can figure out. I mean, I mean, for us. I don't know that we could get really much more than that for what we're doing without adding something else. Yeah. Okay, but so when we were talking about those, those tribute shows, cause so me and Mary Ellen, and Steve, yeah. we've yeah. talked about this, like, you know, the, the metric is, you know, an, a, 
a martini costs 12 to 14 bucks in most places around here. And, and in a nice place, it's 16 to 18 bucks, right? Is your band providing two to three, uh, four hours of entertainment worth more than one martini? Yes. That's a great way to, to do this. Yeah. Cause I was just doing it based on my gut feel for, for this area, right? It, it, I think there is no difference between a $5, $10 or $20 cover here. Like if people want to come out and see you and you're providing the right thing, they will be there for that here. I feel like, and I, I could be wrong, but I don't think I am. I, we've kind of tested this a little bit. I, I think that to, to jump to, from 20 to 25 here is, is sort of the, the, the break point you, it, mm-hmm. where you are, it seems to be above 30. Right. And then that's fine. You figure that out, but to use your martini metric, that's great, <laughs> right? Like you should be charging more than one drink worth uh, you know uh for your band otherwise like the like because people are going to come and buy a couple of those anyway so th- that sets the bar for you already you just that use that so find out what a martini is and charge more than that you the know? martini metric that's the martini that's the title. metric maybe that go. is the title of the show i like that it? yeah that's a better title isn't it kind of rolls off your tongue yeah no you're totally right yep it's the martini <laughs> metric i like it um it, while we're on this this subject you know i have we have all experienced clubs that have built-in audiences and we have experienced clubs that rely solely on whatever their entertainment is for the night to fill the place and i have uh, played in bands uh, you know where i can fill places like that like no problem but oftentimes i have found that i am not interested in playing at your club if you are so hostile to your crowd that you don't have a crowd like that, that's what I have noticed is places that need a hundred. It's, it's fine if it's, you know, it's supposed to be 50, 50 or something. I mean, if there's some expectation that the band's going to bring some people, like I, I get that, but a hundred, if a hundred percent of the people are supposed to be brought in by the band, that to me is a warning sign that there's something wrong with the club. Sure. Uh, that, you know, because because in theory, if I bring in whatever, 200 people tonight, 10 of those should say, oh, I like this place. Who else is playing here? Like, this is a nice place. The the drinks are good. The staff's nice. The, the, the sound is good. Whatever it is. Right. There should be some number of people that you as the club owner have a reasonable chance of assuming as regulars. And, 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 and you should be doing that if you are the club owner and if you are not doing that, or if just by nature of how you run things, no one is attracted in that way to your business. Chances are, I am not going to be attracted to play there either. And it has nothing to do about whether or not I can bring people in. It's, it's what, what's going to happen to my people when I bring them to your place? What's absolutely if the door staff is hostile, if the the bar staff is hostile and not, you know, not, there's a reason that the, uh, you know, what, what bar doesn't have a local draw? I mean, there are some, but, but, and again, you're, you're asking the right question. You know, why, why, you know, why? Yes. If you're doing it right, that you should have a local draw. If you're doing it right, you should have a local draw. I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a really bold question because the first thing I was thinking is like, well, if it's up to me to bring 100 percent of the crowd, give me 100 percent of the door. Well, you, then you, there's you a whole the different, bar money. Right. That's right. You keep your bar money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Right. But, you know, you'd like to think it's a partnership like all these things are supposed to be like we're working on together. He'll do some promoting, yep. you know, we'll you know, we'll, we'll give you ongoing customers. But if that whole equation isn't there, we've had we have a bar around here that we did one gig and it was hostile. We had a man the door. Uh, it was hostile to the door staff. It was it was just not the right vibe in like people got way too drunk and they were the regulars who got way too drunk. And it was just. It was just not a, you know, and, and, you know, you and I talk about this and you and I have the, uh, the luxury of, of turning things down. Declining a gig. That's correct. Of course. And, you know, again, total respect and understanding that, you know, when you're trying to build a name, I told you we did it. We did. In fact, this very club that I'm talking about, the house rockers did a year of Wednesday nights when we were first starting out Wednesday, freaking nights, nine 30 to one 30, having to go to work the next morning to try and just work on our show build an audience, build a reputation. Yep. I mean, it, it's just was part of what we did. There's and actually nothing, and thinking about it, it's that. this same club that we, you know, came back to and, uh, and tried one more time many years later. And it just wasn't a good fit for us anymore. Just the, 
the so the the other part of it is there's the there's a, if they have no fans, but if also if it's a um, almost if it's not the right environment for what you do, if you you know if you're an that ABBA too. tribute band. Sure. You know, and you say, hey, we're going to go into a biker bar and, and, you know, we're going to go over. Maybe there's some magic and serendipity that makes those two things happen. But, you know, remember, there's a match to the style of band you are and the you know type of entertainment you provide and what that local draw that what that that built in audience is expecting. Right. If they want. Totally. Yeah. 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 But I get it. Yeah. We've we've had some experience with clubs that, you know, we've played and then things change there. And it's like you can watch you can see the local crowd dwindling at, at, at this one place. And it's like, oh, OK, nope, nope, not interested in playing that game. Nope. <laughs> and it's sad, you know, you know, and I have seen like online commentary, too. But, oh, yeah, you know, it's weird there. I, I'm never comfortable. I'm never sure what to do. It's like, whoa, that's like, hopefully the owners or managers or, you know, powers that be are paying attention to this stuff. Um, and hopefully they care. Right. Um, but that's, it's a, it, I, I also get it. Right. It's a tough business running a it's nightclub. A yeah. Yep. The, the successful ones um, that I've talked to. And I, I mean, I, I, there's one example in particular, but, but it's true of all the successful ones that I've, I've played at. But this guy that runs uh, the club we play down on Hampton Beach that I've been playing for, you know, 14 years since I've been here, he owns the club. He owns the hotel. He owns the whole building and, and he built a hotel upstairs. Uh, there's a restaurant there and, you know, all kinds of stuff. But, you know, I watch how much alcohol they sell like while we're playing because, you know, you can kind of see the bar and you see how many drink how the drinks are flowing. And I've talked to him like, man, you must make a ton of money off alcohol. He says, we do OK. He says, but I sell food. And I'm like, really? He's like, I'm like, but you have the hotel. He says, yeah, to sell food to the people that stay at the hotel. He says, I sell food. It's his mantra. And this dude only his club is only open maybe five months out of the year. And 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 he spends his winters uh, in Florida playing golf. He only plays on days that end in Y, to be fair. But uh, <laughs> but yeah. Yep. And he, he's been he's been very successful. And uh, uh, again, other club owners that I've I've worked with, you know, that own it, not just a uh, like a bar. But but if there's a restaurant there too, the successful ones know that their business is selling food. Interesting. It's really interesting. And maybe yeah, that's I thought, only. I thought booze was the easiest thing, the highest margin. Thing. I, I did, too. And every one of them I've asked, you know, after this one guy told me, no, Dave, I sell food. I'm like, I, Jim, I got you. I hear you. And then I've kind of asked around with other people that I've, you know, that you can tell are, you know, long term and have had some success. It's like, so if you had to tell if you had to take one thing away, uh, booze or food, what would it be? They're like, oh, no, food stays. That's where that's mm. where the money's made. It's like. Really? Interesting. I you never would have thought that. But it, again, it's just, you know, you learn these things about, you know, this business that you're not in, but you're involved in. And and then you have an easier time sort of sussing out. Do I want to get, you know, involved with that particular instance of this other business? Uh, yeah. OK, that sounds good. Or mm, no, mm. you know what? Maybe maybe not tonight. Thanks, though. Yep. So thinking about that, I, I just wanted to share that we played Saturday night with a club date. The band played great and it was fun, but it was a really small, smaller than usual crowd at our regular club. Sure. And uh, the deal was there was a full day wine walk in the town during the day. So people were kind of day drinking all day. Yep. Then the, then the Warriors were on, then the Sharks were on. And so, you know, it was just not a going out night, even though it was a beautiful you know, spring afternoon. Sure. But I was reminded that, you know, stay humble, my friends, because, you know, as great as you think you are and as great as you think your draw is, you're only as good as your last one. Right. Yes. You yes. got to go back to the drawing board, promote, you know, do do what you do to keep your machine moving forward. It It's true. And I will say this. And, and this is not just about bands, but it, I've certainly proven it to myself with bands. I've proven it to myself in many businesses. In fact, we were sort of having this conversation in a completely unrelated way before before we did the show today. If you, you know, have built your band up to a level where you're experiencing some success and then you stop doing some of those things and it it fades off a little bit. You can put the work in again and build it back up like it, this is not an impossibility. It's there's not just one round. You you get many and, and you can you can do it again. You just have to do it again. You know, you got to put the work in. Yep. You yep. Put, and you, you have to put the work in every single time. You All stay the hungry. time. 
Yeah, you got to stay yeah. hungry. Yeah, that's really it's not just stay humble. It's stay humble and hungry. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, we've had uh, we'll, we'll leave it with the uh, the martini metric because because I like <laughs> that the best. But we've had I mean, we've had a good three. band name, too, isn't it? Oh, that it is. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I like My that. gift to you people out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, with the gifts like that, I think we need to, that's a, that's a perfect note to end it upon here. So thank you so much for listening, folks. Thank you for, you know, come check out, go to giggabpodcast.com and, and check out the, the show notes that we build with the chapters and, and everything and, and give us feedback on, on that and everything else. You know, we're, we, we are happy to iterate this based on, you know, what you suggest that fits with what we do. We're, we're here for you. It's, you know, it's a, it's a two way street. It really, it's not a two way street. It's just, we're all in the same club together. So it's all fine. You know, it's good. And we got to talk about the martini metric somewhere. So I think that's, uh, that's, that's here. It's a safe place. We can talk about martini metrics. Look how safe we are here. It's so good. safe. So safe. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Paul. Hey, um, now that you're feeling better, I just want to make sure you remember that ever important advice, which is... What would that be, brother? Always be performing. Duly noted. <laughs>